Thank you, Lord. There is power in the name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, the Lord is good. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I was debating um, on whether, amen, the Lord has been kind of uh, dropping some things in my heart. And I said, well, Lord, what does it have to do with um, with um, um, you might want to start a CD moment if you haven't. I said, Lord, what does it have to do with what you're doing now? And of course, you know, I don't know all that is involved because I haven't talked about it yet. <laughs> so I don't know all that I'm going to say. But, but I trust that that God will show us. Amen? I do know this. Holy Spirit starts saying to me, there is coming a powerful unity amongst believers. Amen. But well, the way I heard it, I expressed it that way, but the way I heard it was the coming unity. Amen. And so as you look at Genesis 1, I'm going to quote this a scripture that you all are familiar with. And we're going to experience this more and more in the coming days. Now listen to me how I say this. A lot of this unity is based, now listen to me very carefully, y'all. A lot of this unity is based on how we respond to one another. Amen. Not just a body, but specifically as a local church. God, when he established places of worship, whether it be in a house, whether it be in a cathedral, or whatever it is, wherever it is, he sets a candlestick. That candlestick is an angel. That angel is over other angels. And those angels are present to see to it that the vision God pours into the leadership is carried out. You hear me? Remember to the seven churches the Lord said, and he challenged them. If you do not fulfill your mandate, what did he say? I will come and remove your candlestick. Amen. Well, that candlestick is that angel. Amen. And so, <clears throat> when you talk about laws that governs the spirit world, The angels operate according to the measure, amen, that is given to men. When I say men, you understand I mean mankind, both woman and men. Amen? What do I mean? Well, remember Paul said repeatedly, according to the measure of grace that is given unto me, I ran my race. Now you can readily see how the Apostle Paul accomplished more than many of the other apostles. Amen? It had nothing to do with Paul himself as a man. It had to do with the calling. Within the calling, there is a measure and a set amount of grace. God's ability to carry out the calling. It is no different with your own individual life. Amen? First of all, you are called to be like him. Within that calling is a measure of grace to get you there. 
to become his bride. How many of you know many, most, will fall short of that calling, even though it is given to them? Right? Right? As you begin to walk out that calling, and you reach certain levels in the calling, just like you do in school. When you go through school, then when you got passing grades, you got a report card, and then you were promoted, you moved on. It's no different spiritually. This is why many are called, but few are chosen. What? Few are promoted to move on in their calling. Why? because they don't access the grace that is given to them. Amen? Amen? So all of us, brother, sister, has an appointment of bridalship to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. All of us. Your second most important calling is to do what you were sent to the earth to do. Amen. Within my calling happened to be simply a ministerial calling. Within we call the fivefold. Within your calling, there is a ministerial calling too. Ambassadors. Amen. Ambassador. You know what an ambassador is? Every country has ambassadors. They send a person from that country to that nation to represent that nation, right? Every ambassador has a place where he conducts his ambassadorship. It's called an embassy, right? Within that embassy, that embassy has the power to do what? induct memberships or citizenships. People run to the embassy, amen, for different reasons. But the major reason is looking for what? Citizenship into that nation. What am I saying to you? That embassy, though in that country, is United States ground. Just as it was in this country. You intrude in that embassy, you are on U.S. ground, even though it is in another nation. That's why even the nations that are there will there not dare do what? Attack that embassy. To attack the embassy is to attack the U.S. This is what happened in Benghazi. Amen. Libya. Uh, Syria, Syria. Libya, yeah. So, look at yourself. You were born again. You became a citizen of heaven. You did not go home right away. You were left here. You were given an ambassadorship to represent heaven. To represent the king. Amen. You have the authority as an ambassador to go and tell people, be ye reconciled to God. Become a citizen of heaven. You have the authority to do that. You have the authority to say your sins are forgiven. That's what you have. As an ambassador, you've been given that authority. We don't use it. Amen. Amen. And that's what that's what that's what Corinthians said. Jesus, as an ambassador from heaven, said to a man, "Your sins are forgiven you." <laughs> First, he started grumbling. Who has power to forgive sin? Nobody but God. Well, you've been given that power. Why aren't you running? carrying your embassy with you, your mobile embassy with you, trying to get as many people as you can into your embassy, into heaven, into eternity on the inside of you. Amen? 
I submit to you. If you walk in your authority more given through the name of Jesus, you can break the power of sin that holds people. But see, we don't operate, as the man of God said the other night, we don't operate from the position of king. Huh? Why did he give you his name? Why did he give you his clothes? Huh? Why did he give you angelic hair and camp round about you? Why did he give you grace to impart at you at that moment a surge of power to break the chains of darkness off of those who are not part yet a citizen of heaven? He gave you that. You don't have to think about it. He told you in Mark 16, 16, go ye into all the world, amen. In my name, cast the devil out. In my name, speak with new tongue. In my name, lay hands on the sick. What are you doing? You are doing that as an ambassador, as a king. See? But we go there, first of all, we don't even attempt to do it. Oh, well, nothing might happen. Yeah, it won't. Because you're operating in fear. You don't think it will happen. Well, it ain't you that's doing it. It's him. He needs your body. He needs your hands. He needs your feet. Do you hear me? See, a part of coming into unity, brother, sister, is having his heart. The, the fact of the matter is, we don't care. We are so consumed in, with our world and what's going on with us that we don't care that the world is dying and going to hell around us. I mean, that's a simple fact. What did Jesus say as an ambassador? I came not for the whole, I came for the sick. I came not to condemn the world. So why are we condemning it? They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're sinners. Why are we condemning them? Because we are not operating as an ambassador. We have a set call to go out and tell the world, be ye reconciled to God. You don't have to stay in your sins. You don't have to stay bound by sickness and disease. You don't have to stay like that. I have authority as an ambassador to tell you, you can be free. Let me pray for you. Let me cast the devil out of you. Let me break the chains of darkness. Let me lay hands on you, and I guarantee you, you'll be here. Listen, you can get sinners here 99 times faster than you can another Christian. Because he put, he put sickness, he put the gifts in the church for the world, not for the church. Healing is the children's bread. We eat the bread. Amen. So what am I saying to you? Things are not happening because we are not doing. We are not taking our place. This is going to change. And this coming unity. It's going to change. Having unity, first of all, is receiving the heart of the Father. Remember I told you the other night. One of the characteristics of the Father. When you think of glory and honor, think of lowly and abase. Brother, sisters, you got to take your time, take your energy. Amen. And you have to come lower that you might lift people up. That's what Jesus did. Do you hear me? That's what Jesus did. He went about doing good. He accept the negative talk. He accept the judgment against him. He did not combat it. He did not fight back against it. He only stood up and fight when it was those who tried to stop those from receiving what God wanted them to have. That's the only time. If there is somebody who wants God's power, 
then you have the, uh, the right and authority, amen, to challenge anyone that is stopping, standing in the way from someone from receiving God's power who wants it. That's when Jesus stood up. That's when he called them what they were. That's when he called them out. But when the, when the attack was against him, he could care less. Amen. He went where the sinners were. Listen, this is what John the Apostle had a problem with. John did not drink liquor. John did not hang out with sinners. Jesus come doing the exact the opposite, going to parties, <laughs> hanging out with the sinners, the tax collectors, the dirt of the dirt, the tax collectors, stealing people. Jesus hang out with them. And John says, wait a minute. You're not what I expected. John almost got offended. John almost, amen, got stopped in his tracks about his perception of Jesus. I submit to you, brother, sister, present day Christianity has changed what Jesus really is. Jesus would not be accepted in most churches today. Amen. Because of the people he hang out with. Do you hear me? Well, brother, sister, we got to go where the people is that the world has rejected. Not judge them. Not judge why they are sitting in their ways. Not judge why they are drunkard with liquor. Amen. Not judge why. Amen. But give them the answer. You as an ambassador of the king have the authority to bring them out of their mess. So if you're not going to bring them out of your, their mess, you have no right to talk or to judge them. There is a unity that is coming. I'm telling you, this is what's on the Father's heart. He's coming to you first. It's not to bring you a whole lot of power. He's coming to you first. It's to set your head on straight. Amen. To bring heaven's agenda on the inside of you. To bring God's heart. God's heart aches for the reason his son died for the souls of men. And you have the authority to reconcile them to God. Brother, so, so this must be our agenda as a local church. If not, why are we here? Why are we here? I am not here to pacify you with a new word of revelation so you can suck them it up to yourself and grow spiritually flat, fat and not go out and challenge the spirits of darkness. Or oh, we stand in jeopardy of having our candlestick removed. Do you hear me? It says how good and how pleasant it is for brothering to dwell together in unity. What is the purpose of unity? Having the same mind, one in which I just explained concerning ambassadorship. That's first and foremost before God. What is the purpose of unity? And it just come in and sit in a room together? No. What is the purpose of unity? He goes on to tell you. It is like the precious oil or anointing or ointment that flowed down on Aaron's beard. What? When he was anointed, the high priest. Huh? To speak for God and to minister to God. Right? Do you have God's message? I submit to you. You'll find yourself walking in more of the anointed if you get God's message. Part of God's message is connected to why you are here. Huh? What is your message? To the rest of the world. 
What part of that message has God given to you? I'm trying to tell you why he's coming to us in unity. He's coming to bring you his heart. In bringing you his heart, he's bringing the word for you. That word for you is the word that you are to give to those out there. Amen. This is, I mean, this is, this is very much so on God's heart. Because, I'm, again, the, the present day church in its present condition, God has abandoned it. Why? Because it has given himself to the spirit of Babylon. It has its own agenda. It does not have God's agenda. Amen. So God is calling those within the collective body. He's calling them unto himself. He's calling them out of a system that has governed the church too long. Amen. And you walk up to most Christians and you tell them, ask them, what is their purpose, why they're here. And none of it would be concerning what I just said and who you are. That is first and foremost on God's mind. You as a representative. And then we all come, amen, to you are an embassy as you are a temple. Then we all come, amen, to a temple and an embassy, amen. And we all come together, amen, and through anointed men and women, amen, that is connected to heaven, get a fresh word from God, amen, as to what is on the heart of God, what he desires to do, and even within that, amen, a, a little spanking and rebuke. <laughs> Amen. But when you walk out of these doors, you become the mobile embassy again. Tasked with getting citizenships, giving citizenships to those who want to go to heaven. Amen. You know as well as I do, many people out there, their concept, their concept of heaven and what it takes to go to heaven is way out in left field. It is not scriptural. Hallelujah. So with this unity, the Lord is coming to bring heaven's agenda, to set things right again. Amen. Those that have been knocked off skeleton to put it back right again. Amen. To, 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 to get you out of your fantasy world, amen, and what you have as first and foremost and brings heaven's agenda and make it first and foremost again. See, God is only coming to take over where we want him to take over. Where he is is not coming to take or where we he where we don't want him to take over to rule he's not coming he will bypass it whether it's you as an individual or whether it's us as a local church amen he will bypass it so the call tonight is the king is coming amen you must get ready for the king. You must prepare. And he's giving you now his mindset where your mind must be concerning an ambassador of heaven. You know, there are sometimes countries do what? They pull their ambassador when they start acting crazy out on the field. They pull their ambassador because the ambassador is not representing the nation. Amen? Or they close their embassy. 
and that, in that nation now no longer has a voice in that nation because the nation that the, the, the nation that closed his embassy has an argument, has an offense against, uh, an argument against the nation where it presently is. I submit to you, God is about to close a lot of embassies. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, I'm warning you. He's about to close a lot of embassies. And he's about to bring a lot of embassies home. Amen. Before they are closed and never opened again. I'm talking about the local church and you as an individual. The thing is here, we have come up to critical mass now. You know what I'm saying? The things that are happening in our world and in nations of the world are happening because the weight of sin upon the nations of the world now have reached critical mass. What we have seen with storms and hurricanes and volcanoes, there is a volcano that will hit our nation very soon. Last year, amen, in, in times of intercession, I kept picking this up. I kept picking this up. And millions, hundreds of thousands will die. And then for a while, uh, um, I could tell that 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 judgment had been set back and there was a safe there was a safeness but now just recently I've hit it again and there is a volcano that will be released in our nation very very soon with lots of loss of life and not just in our nation they are going to happen all around the world what is happening? somebody said God is judging no not really not indirectly. What is happening is we have sown to the wind. We're about to reap the whirlwind. The weight of sin on nations of the world is causing the earth to groan, to groan. Amen. As it groans under the weight of sin, judgment is released. But at the same time, what happens? It's groaning, starts a groaning within the sons of God or the future sons of God. Amen. The birth painting in the earth starts a birth pain in the people of God. And that birth pain in the people of God, that groaning, that travailing in the people of God brings forth what? The sons of God. This is what is happening, brother and sister. And the more, more horrific things happen around the world, the more dark it gets, the more the sons of God will emerge under that pressure. You hear what I'm saying? In and in and of itself, and there is a unity, there is a connecting together that will begin to happen. There is a spiritual drawing together, together, a coming together. There is a connecting spiritually, amen, and, and uh, even a gravitating towards one another that will begin to happen, amen. Because, listen again, many churches will be destroyed. Many embassies will be closed, amen. Um, when <coughs> when. When this unity begins to happen and this judgment begins to happen, there are things that will be exposed. Let me tell you something. The world just went through an explosion, an exposure of sexual filth amongst its ranks. It's about to happen in the church. God is going to expose on every level, especially in the pulpit in ministry. Those are involved in stuff. I'm telling you, get ready. And steady yourself because it's going to rock the church to its core. You hear me? Before it's over, you're going to hear people say out of their mouth, 
is there anybody saved, really saved? God's going to expose it. Because he have, he have dealt and dealt and dealt with them behind the scene. And they have sat in their sins and sat in their ways. And the same thing God did to the seven churches of Asia Minor, he challenged them. This is what God has been doing for quite some time to the church. So now he's going to expose the filth. The same way he did back in the days of Jim Baker and Jim Swagger. That was a warning. But now it will be worldwide. It will be church-wide. You hear what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? And there will be a big offense that will roll through the body of Christ because people have their confidence in human beings and instead of God. And it, they will derail the faith of many. Do you hear me? It's going to happen, brother, sister. So this is why it is so important. It is so important that as a local church who we say this is what we are called as a local church, that we first of all start recognizing and acknowledging our authority and what we are supposed to do while we come together. But we better start, amen, covering each other in prayer. Do you hear what I'm saying? This, brother, sister, there, I used to tell my kids growing up, there's nothing more important than family. That's what I used to tell them. There's nothing more important than family. Listen. The same thing is applicable spiritually. There's nothing more important than your spiritual family. Nothing. Huh? Listen, if you're not willing to die to the person next to you, then you're not worthy of him. I'm going to say it again. If you're not willing to die for the person next to you, you are not worthy of him. Because that's what it must come to. The relationship between each other. I'm talking about in the local church now. It should be as in the church as a whole. But in the local church now. The relationship must be as such. If you're not willing to die for the one next to you, you are not worthy of him. This is the level of love that you must attain to. Greater love has no man or woman than this than he laid down their life for a friend. Huh? I mean, you can go to any, all types of churches where people come and go and they'll barely know the people's name who they supposedly are worshiping with. That is, that is, that is, that is unbelievable to me. Do you hear what I'm saying? When you worship... You are opening your spirit up to whatever it is around you when you worship. Will you walk in the natural, walk into a room where there is disease that you can, that you can catch? No, the average person will not do that. Well, that's what's happening spiritually. When we come together, we open our spirit up. And whatever is in the room, the person is, that has, amen, it can be attached to you. But part of worshiping and honoring God is bearing one another's burdens. Bearing one another's burdens. Allow the Holy Spirit to lift a burden off of someone who's standing there trying to get a breakthrough, trying to get healing or whatever it is, 
and the Father drops it on you because you have the breakthrough, you have the anointing, whatever. And at that moment, at that moment, grace is poured through you and reaches them and they never know you was the cause of their breakthrough. It all happens in the exchange of worship in the service. That's unity, brother, sister. That's caring about those, amen, that you are worshiping with. We have to get rid of this disconnect. We have to. It's going to cost you in the days to come. Look at what look at what Genesis says. Genesis, Genesis, two, um, two eighteen. Listen, how many of you know the family was before the church? The family was before the church. If you got a dysfunctional family, you're going to have a dysfunctional church. Amen. But the church is the house of God. The place, amen, where all things are made new. But again, God doesn't force himself on anybody. Amen? So, this is why the enemy has been ta attacking vehemently the family. Amen? Attack the family and you can keep the church un under unstable ground. So, God has to do what? For God to have a strong church, he must have a strong family. Amen. So the first thing that the enemy did when God brought the first family, the enemy started doing what? Attacking the family. The man did not take his place as the head. Adam did not take his place, amen, as the head of the head. He did not take his place. And because of that, the enemy got in. And when the enemy got in, he brought murder, the spirit of murder between the children. Amen? Amen? And he brought dysfunction everywhere. Right? Now, under the law, you have to literally kill someone to take their life. How do you mean to know there is a difference between murder and killing someone? God commanded Israel to kill all the time, but he never commanded them to commit murder. Amen. God brings judgment and cause killings. But murder is a different thing. Cain did not kill Abel. He murdered Abel. Under the new covenant, Jesus said what? If you hate your brother, you've already committed murder. What is he saying? The spirit of murder is in your heart. We see the spirit of murder being released in our streets right now in America because people hate what the other side represents. The spirit of murder is being released in the nation because of that very thing. 
So God must bring, God must move the dysfunction out of the families that are in the local churches. And so that means do what? Get the man back where he should be. Amen. Now look what he said. And the Lord said, verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. Good in retrospect, in, 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 in retrospect to many things concerning his plan for man. Amen. And man himself. As a person. So. I will make him. And help me. For him. That word help me in the original Greek. You know what it means? Equal partner. I'll say that again. Equal partner. Equal partner. Under sin, the woman fell, amen, and no longer was an equal partner with man. Under sin. The dysfunction came. That's why in the Bible days, in the Middle East days, the woman, you hear all hear nothing about the woman in the Old Testament. Unless God raised her, put his hand on her, and did something supernatural to her. It always speaks of the man in the lineage of the man. Amen. This is why a man can have, I don't know how many wives under the old covenant. The woman was a second class citizen, she had no rights. All of this dysfunctionalness came because of the fall. But before the fall, she was an equal partner. Amen. As a, just like you go out and start a business with another person. You're equal partners, but you are what? Help meets to each other. It's the same way it was. So at the fall, it fell all apart. But here comes Jesus. Jesus comes back and restores everything. And in Jesus, what? There's no male or female. But the church, the institution of the church, keeps insisting that there are still two. God said, no, there ain't. There's one. Huh? God, you see the story there. Put Adam to sleep. Took, took the formation, what he started with the woman's body, shaped it. Where did he get the woman's spirit? You've heard me say this before. Where did he get the woman's spirit? God didn't breathe into the woman like he did the man. He got the woman's spirit from Adam. Adam had both male and female qualities. Now, I didn't say he was gay. Don't think gender. Spirits have both male and female qualities as individual entities, spirits. If an angel appeared right here, Another angel would step out of that angel. It would be his female quality and his male quality. God split that from Adam and took the female quality and put it into a body he formed from Adam. Brought her back to Adam. Adam looked at it and says, bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh, I will Notice, God didn't name her, Adam did. I will call her woman, W-O-M-A-N, man with the womb. 
Amen. Co-partner, co-equals. And so God, because of the and, and because the fall disrupted everything, now this man and this woman must struggle now to be one. Come back into unity. Now they can come back in unity very fast in the natural. Let's go to bed, kick out a baby. Unity. The results of two people. The kids sometimes coming out looking like the one, sometimes looking like the other, and sometimes coming out looking like both of them. Unity. But the spiritual unity takes time. Amen. This is what God is after now. This is what you are after as an individual. Unity, spirit, soul, and body. This is what God is after with you. Unity, one with him. Do you hear me? Look, flip over to um, John 16. I'm almost done. John 16. Listen, God said unity is coming. So what is God going to do? In his appearing, he first is going to restore the family. This is the first thing. He's going to start restoring the family unit. Amen. The second thing, amen. No, first of all, I'm sorry. The first thing is the unity within you, the spirit, soul, and body. The second thing, the unity in the family. Amen. And the third thing, the unity with him. John 16. Look what Jesus prayed. 17, I'm sorry. Verse 13, and now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. His joy was to do the will of him that sent him. Brothers and sisters, you will never, ever be happy without doing what God programmed within you to do. You will never be happy. That joy grows. The more you are in the will of God, the more joyful, the more happy you will be. The farther you're away from the will of God, the more disgruntled and mad and mean, amen, and grumpy you will be. He says, I have given them thy word, and the world hated them, and they're going to hate you. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. See, you're an ambassador. Your citizenship, your green card is in heaven. Amen. What is the signature of that green card? Jesus Christ in you. The hope of this world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. And I know that sometimes that's what we pray to. No, your heart knocks is to make you where you can withstand the hell in the world. Not for you to pray, take me, Lord, take me. No, you don't want that to happen. So I don't want you to take them out, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. See, that's the God's plan. How is God going to keep you from the evil? Okay? Listen to me. Being perfect does not mean you are without sin. I want to say that again. Being perfect does not mean you are without sin. You have a sinful nature. Being perfect means that you do not practice sin. Amen. We are to mature, become perfect. Do not practice sin. Amen. Jesus was the personification of God without sin, but yet he could be tempted. He 
did not practice, he did not yield to sin. Did he? But he could have failed. So I'm like, really? Well, this wasn't a charade. Amen. It wasn't a game. Lucifer tempted him because he could fall. But he did not. The problem is we live more in the flesh than we do in the spirit. This is why we fall when we are tempted. But this coming unity, this coming unity will take away the enemy's ability to enable us to fall through temptation. Amen. So Jesus' prayer, I pray that thou should not take them out, but that thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, through the bread that came from heaven. Sanctify them. Separate them from the evil that is within them. Amen. That's what sanctification is. You judge yourself. Amen. The problem is in your life. You judge it. Amen. Even when you fall, you, 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 you screw up. The only way you're going to separate yourself from the sin is to judge yourself. When you judge yourself, you just sanctified yourself. You separated yourself from the sin. Now you're on the road to overcoming what made you sin. That's sanctification. So he said, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is true. And as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world, you ambassador. But he didn't wait till you were perfect. He didn't wait till you were sinless. Amen. He wants you to work out your salvation as you are an ambassador. Amen. See? Because when you will screw up and when you feel condemned a, little a lot of times, that makes you what? That makes you more um, heartfelt in your prayer. That makes you more compassion, compassionate. Amen. When you get all haughty and pride and think you all that with a cup of cheese, guess what? You lose compassion. You can't touch the lowly. You can't become low and lift up. Hallelujah. This is why God lets us a lot of times feel the brunt of our sin. So he says, and for their sake, see, it wasn't for his, it was for yours. For their sake, I sanctified myself. He said, for their sake, I showed them how to do it. I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through truth. So Jesus came as truth, as the word, sanctified himself in the flesh as a man, overcame everything, and now he is the author of sanctification. He is sanctification. So Jesus said, if you do what I do and say what I say, you can become what I became. Amen. You can't do it without him. You can't do it without truth. Now here's the good part. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which will believe on me through their word. Say, that's us. See, we wasn't there when Jesus preached this. So he's talking about us. Also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. Unity. As thou, Father, art in me. And I, Father, 
am in thee. That they also may be one in us. You know, you need to read that until your eyes turn red. This is the crux right here of the gospel. This is why Jesus died. This is bridal ship. Amen. God was in Christ, reconciled in the world unto himself. When Jesus proved up until the age of almost 30, and he sanctified himself up until that time, when God the Father, now listen, Jesus is God. Understand that, Jesus is God. When God the Father came down on him and the anointing as the Spirit, then Jesus' Spirit, was in heaven and God the Father stepped inside of Jesus' soul and God the Father went around doing the work while Jesus' soul was on the earth with God the Father working through him and Jesus' spirit was there beside the throne of God watching it all the same thing is going to happen to you in this coming unity that's what this unity is all about. When he becomes one in you, and you become one in him, that's him possessing your soul. Now your spirit in turn now will go to heaven, and you will watch him work through you on the earth. That's what this coming unity will bring. This is what Jesus prayed for. This is what he desired. This is what he's going to have. Do you hear me? Last one, Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Listen, brother, sister, it has begun. It has begun. Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 5, verse 14. Now we exalt you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See, that is the fruit of the Spirit. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. See, you can't do that without sanctifying yourself. See? That's what this resisting sin, not being a sinner, is all about. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Why? Because you're going to catch some hell doing this. So in the middle of all of that, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is what God wants you to do. Why does God want you to do that so bad? Because he can't help you if you don't. That's why. Quench not the spirit. See, to not do this, you're quenching the Holy Ghost. Despise not prophesying. Amen. Prophesying is simply preaching. When God comes to rebuke you and bring you truth, don't despise it. Prove all things. God's giving you a challenge. Prove what he said. Make sure that it works because it does. But you can't prove it without doing it. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all the appearance of evil. Not just the evil, but the appearance of it. Now watch this. Once you do all of this, it is capsulated in this thing right here. And the very God of peace sanctify you. Sanctify you. Holy. That's not H-O-L-Y. Look at that. 
That's W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy. That means unity. Oneness. God is able to allow Jesus Christ to possess your soul. God is able to ha- allow the power of God to keep your body under. You got your spirit, spirit, soul, and body now operating the way it should. In the middle of all of that, amen, in the midst of all of that, if you are married, what is happening? There is a oneness that is taking place between the man and the wife. A oneness. Amen. Her spirit starts to possess his spirit, and his spirit starts to possess her spirit. There is a oneness that's taking place there. There is a oneness that is taking place between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ starts possessing your spirit and your soul, and you start possessing his. And there is a oneness that is going on inside of you, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Everything is coming together, operating as one the way it should. God is not going to get what he wants until that happens. Amen. This is why it has begun. Amen. In the midst of all of this, you, 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 you cannot afford to be disqualified. See, to be disqualified, amen, is for God to pull your ambassadorship in order to save your soul. Do you hear me? Remember, just as the 72 left the Lord and never walked with him, just as Judas walked away from the Lord, amen, there is a whole mass exodus that is getting ready to come to the church called the great falling away. Many will not make it back to the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because of that, the Lord is going to take many ambassadorships and take people home so that they don't lose their soul. Amen. When your ambassadorship is poor, you will not experience this unity. Or, let's use another word for it, rest. We enter into rest when Jesus now starts driving the ship. When Jesus starts working through us and our spirit is in heaven looking down, we enter into rest. Amen? Paul said in Hebrews, there is a rest for the people of God. There is a millennial rest where we no longer strive with sin, but there's also a rest within us. It's this unity that Paul is talking about in Thessalonians. And I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Say, well, I don't worry about that body. It ain't going to ever act right. No, in body. Your body will discern evil too and recoil from it, Paul says. And body Be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, he's going to come to you before he comes for you. Blameless. So, brother, sister, you must deal with the duty of sanctification, of unity. It starts with, remember those first verses in Thessalonians before before 17 he said do this refrain from evil you know do all of this you must do your part you must start the work of sanctification or unity within you and then the God of peace will come and sanctify you wholly amen how far are you in cleaning house how far are you how far alone are you in the sanctifying process and you doing your part When God comes, he can't do your part in his too. He comes to complete or do what you cannot do. The 
God of peace will sanctify you wholly. Do you hear me? Unity is coming. Unity in the local church. Unity in the family. Unity with you, within you, and unity with God. Hallelujah. Come on, stand. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your commitment in establishing a house that the Father and the Son can come and abide in. A house you describe it as a house of love that will commit to unity, to sanctification, and rest. You said, them that love me, them that will give themselves to sanctification, my Father will love, and we both will come and make our abode in them. You will set on the seat of their soul the Father and the Son. Oh, hallelujah. They will have they will have an experience that you had on the Mount of Transfiguration. They will have a transfigurating experience. When unity comes, the light within them will begin to shine through their very skin. You said in Isaiah 60 that the light will be seen in this coming darkness. Thank you, Father. We are willing, Lord. We yield to the hand of the potter. We yield to the hand of the potter. Come on, lift up both hands. Thank God for his word. We thank you for the coming unity, Lord. You in us, us in you that we may be made one, one with you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That we might experience the life of the overcomer. The life of the overcomer. Thank you, Father. Listen, if you can see it, you can possess it. Thank you, Father. Behold it. Keep your mind on it. And you will be changed to the very image from glory to glory to glory. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We honor you tonight during this time of tabernacles. We enter in through the door. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Thank you, Father. Lord, help us to get out of ourselves out of our idiosyncrasies, out of our hang-ups, and reach out to one another in love. True fellowship. True fellowship. Hallelujah. A willingness to die for one another. Thank you, Father.